I got to start with the warning. I saw the cool kids do it, and I was like, I don't, I don't have a warning. I kind of want one. So, but it makes sense, right? This is my opinion. I don't want someone from the NSA or whatever showing up. Hopefully that doesn't happen. All right, let's start with uh, something a little more fun. When does something stop being machine learning and become a regression model? We got one laugh. That's all, that's all I needed. Marketing. There we go. I credit this joke actually to uh, Eugene. I won't pronounce his last name here. Okay, I'm Torin Billups, and you're going to talk today about fine tuning language models with Axon. When I originally pitched this talk, there was a broad spectrum of what people said, oh, I'm going to learn this from that talk. And I was like, uh oh. So we're going to start with what this talk is not. So first up, it's not going to be an opinion piece about fine tuning or prompt engineering. We're not going to do a tutorial on Llama 2 and fine tuning that on a single uh, 4090. We're not going to go into the contrast between uh, fine tuning and retrieval augmented generation. That's a new word for me this week. Anybody else? OK, just me. Yeah. Cool. And then uh, lastly, Apparently, a lot of people wanted to know how much it was going to cost, and I don't even know if I could do the math on this, let alone come up with the hardware, so leave that one. So instead, the game plan for today is going to be pretty simple. It's really a beginner's talk. It's about my journey into the fine-tuning process, and of course, a little bit about fine-tuning as we get there. A lot of my journey was just understanding neural networks, deep learning, training. It seemed so magical to me. And I didn't want that. So hopefully, by the end, you won't feel that yourself. The second big stumbling block for me was just transforming and encoding data. As a web developer, I didn't feel like I did that other than over transport. So we'll talk a lot about that today as well. And finally, we'll do a little fine tuning and evaluation. And hopefully, the most valuable part for you, at least it is when I go to conferences, is just what has this person learned? What are the scars that they've gathered along the way? So. When's the last time something felt like magic? And don't say chat GPT, just don't do that. Everybody does that. Like before that, you know what I'm saying, in the good old days. If, if you haven't done anything magical, excluding chat GPT, maybe it's time to learn something new. In fact, I wrote this talk because machine learning just felt like magic to me. And at the same time, all the material that I stumbled into felt like it was aimed at statisticians, researchers, not the average web developer like I am. So to get started, we're going to zoom out, and we're going to take a moment to understand deep learning. I think that will help people in the room that are still connecting the dots, because it's really hard to understand fine tuning if you've never even looked at training. So we're going to spend a good amount of time on that, actually. And we're going to do that with everyone's favorite interview problem, FizzBuzz. <laughs> Turns out it's actually a really great classification problem to play around with. So we're going to get familiar with these concepts. And if you're not familiar, uh, FizzBuzz was actually originally designed, I think, to help students learn division. And so here, we're going to divide a number by three. And if it is a clean division, we print Fizz. Cleanly divisible by five, we print Buzz and both FizzBuzz. I'm sure most of you know this in the room. But we're not going to build this with conditional statements, right, as we normally would. We're just going to use data. And before we can actually create the network that can solve this, we just have to think about our inputs and our outputs. So if we're solving FizzBuzz, an input might be the number three in this example. And if we were putting in three, the prediction or the output, we would hope to be Fizz. See, that was the first test. Fizz buzz. See, nobody still. Nobody knows it. I don't know why. OK. Uh, unfortunately, you can't make a prediction with just the input, right? Or at least not a very good prediction. So we're going to introduce a value. And this number, we're just going to help guide the network to one classification or another. 
And because of the influence that this number has, it's often referred to as weight. So what is a neural network? And this, if you get nothing out of this talk, this is all I hope you get out of it, because this, this really just turned it on for me. And that is just a multiplication problem. We're multiplying the input times the weight. And we're getting a prediction. On some level, every neural network is this. Now, the inputs, the weights, they become more complex, right? But the premise is still the same, which is awesome, right? Because I kept hearing, well, you better go back to school, better get a calculus textbook. Well, the more I got into it, I was like, well, I don't know. Maybe I don't. So hopefully this is an encouragement to you as well. Now, that said, if you're looking at this example kind of faded behind the slide, and you're thinking 3 times 0.2 is going to give me fizz. I'm not following this. What if you could give the, could it give the network more information than just the number 3? And if you did, would it be able to make a better prediction, a more accurate prediction? So instead of 3, which is our current input, what if we turn that into a list of numbers and then encode something more useful for classification? Maybe, for example, we divide the input by the number 3 and put in the remainder, and we divide the input by the number 5 and put in the remainder. And if we do this, we're going to have an input really with multiple values. So it's a good time to introduce the, the V word vector, which is really nothing more for us in Elixir. It's just a list of numbers or the simplest way to think about it. And in this case, we just end up with a vector or a list of 0 and 3. If we kind of illustrate this a little differently, 3 is then broken up into these two different nodes, those two values from the vector, 0 and 3. But in addition to there being two vectors now, there's actually also two weights, right? And this changes our simple multiplication just a little bit. We're just going to do some multiplication of those vectors. And the reason that function is called w sum is some people call this a weighted sum. Ultimately, we just do some multiplication, and we add those together, and we come up with this prediction value of 2.1. And if weighted sum isn't ringing a bell and you're in the space, I think other people also call this the dot product. Now, when the network does a prediction like this for classification, the problem is there's not just one output of fizz, yes or no, right? Each of these actually has, uh, each of these classifications actually has their own set of weights. And each of these would be predicted independent of each other. We're not going to add these together. So the good news is this math is a lot simpler. It's just multiplying our number by the vector of the weights. And as we run through and crunch these numbers, we get basically a new vector on the way out. And it's starting to look a little bit more like a legit classification network. Because now we're going to be able to combine multiple inputs and multiple outputs. So as we smash the code together for both of these, we're kind of combining our weighted sum work as well as our vector math. It's important to note one critical change, and that is that the weights themselves are actually a matrix or a list of lists here. So I tried to break this out on the slide. But again, we're just doing multiplication. Now, what about the evaluations? We saw some wacky numbers in there. Where do those fit in? So we have numbers like 089, 0.3, and I don't know how I did it, 0.3 again for FizzBuzz that's kind of hidden by this logo here. But in, these, in the classification example, these numbers at the end, they really need to be a total of 1, 1 1.0. And we're not really fitting into that right now. We just kind of have numbers spilling out. So we're going to do something called softmax. And I think of it as just normalizing the numbers we have by dividing them, each number by the total. And after we apply softmax, we have a little bit more of a normalized range here. So we have 0.58, 0.20, and then somehow 0.20 again. What this means is the network is 58% confident that the input of 3 is fizz. But 58% is not 100%. So what do we do now? Well, it turns out neural networks are not trying to memorize your data. 
but instead they're trying to reduce an error function from the prediction. So how do we define error? And we can do that with this cost function here, where we're going to take the output of our network, which is that 058, 0.2, and we're just going to subtract those values in a way from the ideal output. So the top right, this kind of new set of nodes with the 1.0 represents 100%. We 100% want fizz and 0% for the others. And the really simple calculation we're going to do here is we're just going to subtract those and square it so that we don't deal in negative numbers. Then we're going to take all those numbers and add them up. And we get our error, which is 0.25 in this case. Now remember, we're shooting for an error of, what was it? Zero. So with this information, the 0.25, we can go back and update the weight matrix and try again. And that reveals what learning is in a neural network. It's a search problem. We're searching for the best possible configuration of weights, so the network's error falls to zero. Deep learning unlock. Anybody else? OK. Still in awe. But wait, the network is not doing so well. We run this, and we see fizz and buzz a little bit. But there's one of our classifications that's not even showing up, and that's our friend FizzBuzz, not even on the map. Why is this? So if we step back for a second, we know that the network is learning some correlation in the data. So I kind of conjured up this in my head that imagine it's taking some notes about if the number, if the input is divisible by 3, if it's divisible by 5. So I've kind of mapped that out in a truth table, if you remember those from way back. And in this case, you can kind of see working left to right. So we use the number one, we just end up with zeros, nothing there. But three and five, they both are divisible by three or by five, so we get a one. But that very bottom one seems broken. We're divisible by three and we're divisible by five, yet we're not truthy. So if anybody can remember this operator, the exclusive or, uh, and this is really the problem, right? We should be able to map 15 or uh, sorry, 15 to FizzBuzz, but we're not able to. And this is actually a problem that I learned about, new to me. And it's because we have a single layer perceptron. So our network's not quite advanced enough. In fact, it's not even really a neural network. It's not doing deep learning because we only have an output layer. But we're all functional programmers, so we'll just stack one more layer in there. It's just inputs and outputs, all the same stuff. So the multiplication scales up, and the result Fizz buzz. Hopefully it shows up in all the right places. We're going to move on so fast you can't figure it out. OK. <laughs> now, there's, there's tons of room for optimization, exploration. Uh, honestly, I almost did a whole talk just on this because it was so fun. Uh, but I do want to get back to fine tuning eventually. So my hope here is just going through this. If you're new or you just showed up to hear me speak about this, that deep learning looks less magical, more logical. Now, we haven't talked about Elixir at all. So let's talk a little bit about Axon. And Axon is really cool because you can build these neural networks without going fully in the weeds. And I'll show that here in just a minute by doing that same classification model, but much quicker this time because honestly, Axon just does all the heavy lifting. So here's our model definition, as I like to call it. Exactly the same as you'd expect from our previous example. We've got two inputs, we've got a kind of hidden layer in the middle of three, and we've got a dense layer on the end, which I've only added one additional node here, which is the not FizzBuzz example, which is called none at the very bottom. But otherwise, it's the same network. And one thing I wanted to dive into, I'm not going to do a full source dive into Axon, but just to encourage you to do that as you run into trouble or you get curious, I jumped into that dense, that axon.dense, and I actually found inside the code here, they're just doing nx dot, which should be familiar. I mentioned earlier that we're doing a dot product, and so this was kind of cool to, to see myself just poking around in the code. Now, I didn't talk about these activation functions on the end. We did show the softmax activation function earlier, but I skipped over this other one I just talked about called ReLU. But I don't know why I skipped over it. It's actually simpler than softmax. It's literally just, is this value positive? Cool. If it is not, it is just zero. That's it. And we won't go into specifically why we're using that, but here's how that works. Um, we just pass in a, a value of negative 1, 2, and 0, and out comes only those positive values, of course. Now, 
If you're familiar with Elixir, what I think brings this home is just looking at it as a single pipe chain. We have our input, and that's just our vector of two values, really. And then we have our first hidden layer, which is just really our dot product and the ReLU activation function, followed by our output layer, which is another dot product and softmax. So let's take a look at some of the Axon code to do this. We kind of spelled out some of this earlier when we went through the Fuller FizzBuzz example, but if you're in Axon, you obviously have to declare loss and optimizer. And I think of the, the loss function as kind of that process we loosely went through where it's like, okay, how do I define error? How do I calculate this? What do I do with it? And here I just put a really simple example, which is that during training, the weights are adjusted to minimize the error. Now, I am gonna hand wave past the atom optimizer here. I looked at a paper on that once, not ready for that. But I will say that learning rate that's listed here as one of the parameters is just something that you can tune, which tells you how fast or how slow that the network learns. And then finally, I want to cover uh, just the part that was kind of confusing to me way back when I did this with Axon is that you've got to actually return a stream. And so this is, uh, whoops, yeah, this is the, uh, the stream data and me just using FizzBuzz to label that data. We haven't talked about it yet, but how else is the machine going to learn if you don't actually provide it good examples? For example, how could it learn FizzBuzz is what it is unless we label it here as remainder uh, 15 equals zero as that top example. Uh, and then finally, the, we won't go too much into how to use the, the tuned code or the trained code, but here's a quick look at it in Axon where uh, we basically take those weights and we can call this prediction function. It spits out FizzBuzz, FizzBuzz or None of the above here. Now, if you want to keep going, that's cool. But for sake of time, we got to pull up and get our way still to fine tuning. I did put together a full Axon version of this. And if people are like, well, that's pretty abstract, I want to go a little bit deeper. There's also an NX version out there as well. All right, so let's get into fine tuning. Now, I wanted to condense fine tuning into two steps. So we're going to take a pre-trained model. That means somebody else has already done the work, paid the bill. And then we're just going to tune that model to perform a new but related task. And that task for us today in this little demo is going to be text classification. And since we're working with text, we need a model that understands natural language. And then we're going to create a labeled data set that the machine can interpret. And then finally, we're just going to train the model for classification. Now, I chose to work with BERT mainly because it seems like it's everywhere. And it's basically everybody's hello world for this classification fine-tuning example. Uh, what is BERT? Here's kind of the, the formal definition. But BERT's actually one of the very early language models, I think way back in 2018 sometime. And I just kind of emphasized the part that I cared about here, which is that it's a pre-trained model, but I can use it to fine-tune on a specific task like classification. It also just so happens to be the exact model used in the fine-tuning docs. Uh, for Bumblebee, which helps a lot. So check this out. They kind of go through a Yelp fine-tuning uh, those reviews example, which is kind of cool. All right, so now that we have our model picked out, let's create a labeled data set. And as much as I get excited about the model and all the other fun stuff that comes with training in Bumblebee, the truth is if you don't have good data or you have somebody else's data, you're probably not going to be able to get very far with something interesting. So I'm going to share a couple examples. We're not going to get too hung up on the text examples that I'm using. But here's a few of them. So the price was outrageous, way too expensive. I simply can't justify the cost. These all come from some kind of order cancellation process, right? And what we want to do is we want to take this text and we want to classify it. So we've got a few different labels that we'd expect to output. The first one and all those you just saw are kind of related to price. But there's certainly availability and response time, and of course, a handful of others. I've got about eight in total. And the CSV for this is going to look something like this. So we have our text, like the top line, the price was outrageous. And that number to the left just represents this label, right? Just arbitrary seven. Seven means price. That's all it is. Uh, but because the language model itself can't parse or understand this text, we've got to do the work to actually transform it. Uh, and in the FizzBuzz case, it seemed like it was a little easier. We just basically took each number and turned that into a vector. And that vector had some feature information that helped us classify the data. Now, if we try to apply that loosely to this example, uh, the price was outrageous, we might think about doing something like this, where we have a zero for 
every word except the one that we care about. That way there's really no overlap and we can distinctly know the is not the word price, for example. Unfortunately, you'd have to have a much bigger vector. In the case of BERT, there's over 30,000 words. So your vector is over 30,000 zeros, effectively. And this is kind of that first trade-off of encoding. It's, it's really easy to understand this as a human being, an analyst, and you're like, oh, yeah, I understand where the word came from. Everything else is a zero. But there's some big downsides. And the first is that this is just huge. So this probably wouldn't fly. And, and I'm using the word inference here. You can think of that as the same thing as prediction. But training and prediction or inference would both be much slower as a result with these huge vectors. Another downside is what about words that are completely different, but they're spelled exactly the same, right? They're going to fit into the same bucket. The machine's like, I don't know if this is a fish or something else. What's going on? And ultimately, the real problem here is we just can't identify similarity. So I've got two kind of similar words here, laughed and laugh. But those would be, of course, different words, and the machine would not be able to identify that. And this is a big departure from our experience previously with that FizzBuzz example, because Fizz and Buzz, well, they don't overlap at all. One's divisible by three, one's divisible by five, and that's it. But in text, however, we know that words can be similar depending on how they're used. The challenge here is that, again, with this kind of primitive encoding, cat and dog, if you were to kind of say, are these close? You wouldn't know, because cat and car would have the same measure of closeness. So what we actually need here is a data structure that gives us some way to encode semantic relationship between words. Well, it turns out there is one of those, and that's what word embeddings are actually built for. So let's take a look at a really simple example here. And words that are similar on this plotted line are closer together. So we got car and carpet kind of pretty far apart, and then carpet really far away from cat and dog, which are actually pretty close. And the cool part is that we can actually use the distance between words to measure that similarity. Unfortunately, one number, as we saw earlier, is not a lot of information to encode much about that word. So if we instead represent each word as a two-dimensional number in this vector space, now they look like proper vectors with a direction here. So it's important that we retain the ability to measure the distance between these. And thankfully, somebody smarter than me has already done that in the Elixir ecosystem with uh, cosine similarity. So here's just a way to pull in that library and actually measure the distance between these two. Now, the downside of scaling up the dimensional space is you just can't visualize it in your mind very well, but the software can encode, as you can imagine, a ton of information. And that information is very useful about the word, its context, and ultimately its meaning. So we have to remember that computers lack the ability to comprehend text. So first, we need a data structure that actually the machine can use and interpret. And then secondly, or more importantly, uh, data structure needs to be able to capture this semantic relationship between words. So with this foundation, how do we do it in Elixir? Uh, first, we're going to go through a process of tokenization. We're going to take that text and tokenize it, and then we're going to convert each of those uh, into a particular vocabulary ID, and then we're going to generate word embeddings from these IDs. So here's a kind of screenshot of me using this tokenizer in Elixir. And the function is about halfway down the screen that I'm using to encode this, where I take the tokenizer and I take a sentence like, the price is outrageous, and this spits back an encoding. Uh, the two parts I want to zoom in on, of course, on the very bottom, you can see that the actual tokenization includes two special characters we'll talk about later. But generally, it just kind of breaks up the, the sentence. But for right now, what's really important as well is that we have these IDs that come out of the encoding. And one thing I learned that's pretty cool is that these IDs, although they seem kind of random or unknown to me, they're actually in the vocabulary file for this model. So there's a line number here on the left that I'm highlighting in my editor, and this is kind of mapping up to the numbers you see. Uh, that last one being outrageous was 25506. This is just kind of a cool way to tie those together. Again, hopefully there's no magic here. We're just using words in a vocabulary. They come out of this encoding. Uh, now, if you want to go a little further, you can see the full-blown embedding. Uh, but we're not going to see that just, we don't have to write that code, which is great. But uh, here's the actual embedding. Uh, or here's, here's how you get the embedding with Axon, just using the base BERT model here, uh, passing in a set of those token IDs, which is just a vector of those numbers we saw earlier. And then what we get out of it, well, it's a whole bunch of those 
numbers here, but what are we actually looking at? So if I break this down, we've got a tensor that represents our single input sequence with six tokens, and each of those six tokens has 768 numbers. I know number is the wrong term, but values in there. And this is what it kind of looks like if we orient it a little bit like a table. So you can see there's 768 of these, and we kind of, the, each one of those vectors just represents the word uh, above it. All right, so if we circle back here, this whole tokenization thing, we can see kind of the big picture where we tokenize the input, we get the token IDs, these IDs represent a word in the vocabulary, and then from these vocabulary IDs, we get a contextualized word embedding. So now what? What are we gonna actually do with these embeddings? Well, first it's useful to understand how BERT was trained, and BERT was actually trained on two different tasks. So the first one is called masked language modeling. I had to practice that in the mirror a lot. I don't know why, it just trips me up. And uh, this one I just think more as next word prediction. So if anybody ever told you, oh, chat GPT is just predicting the next word, that's kind of how I think of this training. And the one we're gonna zoom in on today is actually similar, um, it's next sentence prediction. And this involves feeding the model BERT, in this case, two sentences, so sentence A and B. And then we're actually asking it, like, hey, predict that these are related, and then predict if sentence B is actually the next sentence. Like, it might not be. And it turns out this is a really great pre-training task to learn and summarize the entire sequence. So remember that special token I hand-waved over and we said we'd come back to, CLS? Turns out that is this token. That's the summary of the sentence. So we can throw out or ignore all the rest of these embeddings. And then we can feed that output or this word embedding you see on the left here into a single layer with a softmax activation function. And this will actually give us the probabilities of all those labels that we cared about, price, availability, response time, and all the other ones. And then we can use fine tuning, just like we talked about with Axon earlier in the training process, and use all those same tools to do the training and get this probability. So are we finally gonna get to fine tuning? Okay, before we get there, one plug quick to Hugging Face. If you're new, you're just checking this out. Hugging Face, you know, this is my warped view, but I just see it as kind of the GitHub for machine learning. This allows you to pull down models, tokenizers, config. Now, everything you're gonna see and most of the stuff you have seen actually is just up on GitHub. I just have this little public repo called ElixirConf 2023. There'll be a QR code when those slides are coming up. If you just want to pull that down, that's fine. It kind of goes through a really basic example. So let's jump in here. Now first we're going to actually just pull this BERT base model from Hugging Face, which is why I kind of threw a, a link to the site. If you didn't know that's what's happening behind the scenes, we're actually going out and pulling that down. And we're using a particular architecture here. That's why this is highlighted in yellow, because we're doing classification. And Finally, we pull down the, the model and the tokenizer itself. And I wanted to jump in real quick and just kind of inspect the Bumblebee code um, because I don't know the code base that well. But here you can see we're kind of pattern matching this model function based on whatever architecture you used. And remember earlier where I said, oh, we're just going to take that word embedding and then we're going to tack on one more layer? That's exactly what's happening here. So we add one more dense layer and it has the number of labels, which we passed into that spec earlier, which happens to be eight. Very cool. All right, next, uh, we need to actually extract the logits from this model info using axon.nx. And if you're scratching your head, you're like, wait, what's happening? I'm just gonna zoom in one more time on the source code for Bumblebee. We actually return not just model, but kind of like these three different things in the map. So we have logits, which I think of as kind of the model definition or the layer definition and structure. And that's actually what we care about. All right, so next we're going to declare, just like we did in the FizzBuzz example, loss and optimizer. And again, this is all in an effort to minimize the error, because for classification, we obviously want error to be zero. And next we're going to prepare some training data. And this is kind of that get data process, where I basically have a CSV, and I'll show that again if you didn't remember, but it's just basically a number and some string. And this function just streams over the CSV and kind of chunks it. And then as we roll through those, we're just going to use the tokenizer, similar to how I showed earlier. And this is that CSV if you're still scratching your head. When we extract the text and, uh, from that batch and then tokenize it, it kind of looks like this bottom left slide. 
where we basically get those uh, token IDs back, which are the vocabulary IDs, along with a vector of the labels themselves. So you can remember 7672. That was like price availability, price, and response time. Yes, there it is. Um, if you see a bunch of zeros down there in the output, that's just because we're actually padding the response, which I didn't go into that detail, but you, you have a certain length for these as well. And then finally, when we're actually done with this training process, we have something, I just named it updated params. Um, but you actually take the, the loss optimizer and our model, and then just decide to actually do the training with that data that we returned. Now, I do call this out. Uh, if you want to do anything with that data later, you want to put it on S3, et cetera, you definitely want to serialize that out. Simple as this, just write it out to a file. So how do we do? We've got some fine tuning. We have no idea what we're doing. A quick way to look at this is built into Axon as well. And so we're going to first read those params. Let's say uh, you're going to pull those down or they're on the file system. You deserialize that. You're going to create a new set of data. Now, you can go through the same code we did, but you actually want a different CSV. In th this case, the CSV is meant to be very different data. Because remember, we don't want to memorize the, the training set. We want to generalize. So this is different data. And then we attach an accuracy metric and then use this function called uh, axon.loop.evaluator. And then we run it. And if we've done everything right, we get something like this, actually, which is a pretty good accuracy of 90%. But I remember the first time I saw this, it was not what I expected it would be, because I was actually running some training. And through all these different training loops, I was like, wait, I, I saw an accuracy of 98%, but I thought that this said 90%. Well, it turns out that this is just kind of measured on the loss. So it's, it's good information, but it's not really the ground truth for your data. And what's happening back here when we run the evaluator over your own test data is we're actually getting a sense of how it does on data it doesn't know about. So this one is a little more important than this training accuracy. OK, you made it. Uh, we're going to jump into some, some learnings. This is going to be just a quick kind of punch list of all the things that I learned. Uh, and the first was not paying enough attention in college to my statistics instructor, I guess. Um, <laughs> I didn't realize I'd be at the edge of, what, engineering, data or data engineering, statistics, and then your domain expert. So just something to think about. And I just put this quote up here from Eugene, who's apparently my hero. And he just says, if you want to be a serious data scientist, learn statistics. So. Uh, now, I'm excited for the future of machine learning Elixir, but I'm painfully aware of how data illiterate I have been most of my career. Um, so I, I put this little quote together that I hope catches on. But basically, you can come for the language models, the hype, the excitement, but stay for the data, and specifically the data literacy, which I'm just becoming more aware of myself. Um, one of the bigger challenges and more time-consuming parts of this little project I did uh, was just trying to get good data. And so I just put this up here saying, I think good data uh, is just purely the result of hard work. And I can't make this up. My Lyft driver, who brought me over from the airport, is actually a 20-year data science veteran. And I just got to hear him rant for like the 15-minute car ride over here about data is always bad. Don't get into this field. You don't know what you're doing. I'm learning JavaScript. You should do that. And I was like, cool, dude. So I just feel like every experience I hear from someone is around the pain of scraping or engineering or getting your data pipeline, whatever this guy does. And it just, I don't know. It was, it was the highlight of my day, for sure. Uh, I do want to share one painful mistake that I made here. Uh, and that is, of course, anytime you try and cut a corner, take a shortcut, you're going to pay for it somewhere. And for me, the shortcut was like, man, I don't want to hand label 1,000 records. That's just a ton of time. So what if I just do 400? And then I throw that 400 into a certain unnamed model and say, can you rephrase those? That'd be great. And I'll just combine them, and then I'll have 800, and it'll be twice as good. Well, it turns out if you just rephrase them, are essentially the same data. So that ended up costing me in a bunch of time later trying to figure out why is this model performance degraded so badly when I doubled the data. And that's because we're, again, trying not to Memorize, but generalize. And I think my note here uh, was just keep in mind, like, you want a really diverse set of data. You don't want a lot of data that's basically the same thing, like too expensive, that was expensive, too TO expensive. <laughs> like, you don't want a bunch of weird permutations like that, which leads me to the other big kind of learning here, which is garbage in, garbage out. You see this in a lot of the newer language models where they're taking a lot more care and time with the data before they go train. 
because of course the higher the quality of your data, the better the result. So spend some time, have a pre-processing step, go through and look for really weird stuff, like even have a human inspect it truly and just be like, does this data even make sense? All right, so let's go through batch size, which was kind of new to me. I didn't really understand it, so this might just be obvious to everybody else, but during each epic or training loop, you're still going to show the you're still going to show the model as that training step 100% of your data. You're just not going to do it all at the same time, if that makes sense. You're going to chunk it up. And I kind of put this little visual together. Let's say you have 48 samples. What's going to happen during one training run here is you're going to break into groups of 16, and you're going to show the model, hey, here's 16. How did they do? Then you're going to move on. Hey, here's the next 16. OK, and here's the last 16. And then you're going to do that all over again. So you're going to do that a total of three times, which I don't know, visually, I just put this together, and I was like, yeah, it seems obvious. Now, I bring that up as well because batch size is one of those variables that has an impact on performance. So this comes from uh, Dr. Charles Martin. He says, we discovered that when you decrease the batch size, the generalization error gets smaller. He calls this the generalization gap phenomenon. He just says, nobody understands it. Uh, when you train neural networks with smaller batch sizes, they just generalize better. There was kind of a conventional wisdom in this. It just says it gets more intelligent, apparently, about the noise when you have a smaller batch size. And for my case in particular, I started with like a batch size of like 64 using the Bumblebee kind of guide. But I really whittled this down to a batch size of 16, which really helped me generalize a lot better. Now, another thing that should be said is just experiment with different models. You might be surprised at how low work or how low friction it actually is, like literally changing a string from Bert to Roberta, as an example. And of course, if you plateau, this might just help you get a little bit more model performance. For example, I started with Bert. I got about 90% with way too many hours of tuning on this model. And then I tried GPT-2 with literally a single string change, and I got 77, not great. But then I finally flipped over to this a model from Facebook called Roberta, and I, I kind of peaked out at my 93%, which is great. Now, if you're like, what is Roberta? I guess it's just a better trained BERT, but that might be opinion. That might be controversial, so move on. Uh, we have a, uh, I think some of the, the more fun stuff that came out of this too is just uh, in the you know, software engineering space, I'm a very big advocate of fast feedback. I feel like experimentation and learning is just how you grow, how you get better. And so for me, I really should have bought a GPU much faster or much sooner. And then secondly, I should have bought a bigger GPU, of course. So I'm just going to show this really budget card that I got, which I'm still happy. I, I only spent a couple hundred bucks on this. But it really just kind of helped dip my toe into some of these smaller models and just decide, hey, is this worth it? Is it going to be valuable? But one quick example, I did a side by side of uh, this really kind of basic 3060 against a CPU. And it's truly order of magnitude difference. So I'm talking like 720 seconds versus 75 seconds. So if you're coming from the software background, you're used to like change, run my test, go, yeah, this is going to be painful for you. So spend some money, get even a, just a baseline GPU. Of course, I've got my sights set on the 4090, unless Sean wants to give me his at the end of the talk. But this, this card is still on my dream list. And uh, if you are averse to cloud spend like I am, then uh, you can install this with any Ubuntu system. I ended up using System76 uh, Pop! OS. No big deal. And um, the last point I really want to hit on that's related to the learnings here is that it just felt like the whole time I was doing this, it was just all finger in the air, more art and finesse than engineering. And I think it comes down to two issues, really, is that something new to me is that networks are either underfitting or overfitting. And if you're new to this, you're like, what are you talking about? Well, in the overfitting example, the first example here, the network has more or less memorized the data, or that's how it feels, because it's only doing well on the data that you trained it with, and it doesn't really know anything about other data. It's doing very poorly. And then underfitting, that could be a number of things, which is really where I kind of spun my wheels. It's like, do I have enough data? Is the data bad? And I kind of shared that story earlier where I shot myself in the foot and spent a good couple of days just trying to figure out, oh, yeah, not, not diverse data is bad. Um, so I feel like I really want a tool. I desire a tool that makes it closer to engineering and less of an art. And the only one I've really seen that's open source and not trying to take all my money is uh, this Python tool called Weight Watcher. And Weight Watcher, just a quick explanation, I'm not making money on this or anything, is just that it kind of gives you this quality metric they call alpha. And it doesn't require your test data. They're not trying to steal your company's data. It just uses the weight matrices that you have. And it plots this. And what they're trying to do is get you to find somewhere between two and three is their quality metric. 
And it just allows you to see by comparing your model or comparing these models like Bert and Roberta to see are they, are they really hovering around two and three? Well, in the case of Bert, it's actually way out, all the way up to 10. So it's not properly trained. And this is just more information to help you make better decisions. So I hope tools like this become more popular or tools like this become easier to use in Elixir. All right, let's get back to the Elixir hype train. So the Elixir ML community is small, yes, but I've just found tremendous support in the Slack channels, especially for people like me who are new, who are learning, and who are interested. And I think the ML ecosystem in Elixir actually is more plug and play than I realized, which is really the emphasis or the thrust of my talk, which is if you thought this stuff was for researchers and statisticians, so did I. And then finally, as, as Sean and the team has been doing, I think the ML ops experience, and he probably talked about it earlier uh, this week, really allows Elixir and your team to punch up, which is awesome. The operational experience is first class. Um, so I want to end with just a quick note, and this comes from, again, Dr. Charles Martin. And he was interviewed on a podcast, and he said, it used to be that when clients came to me, they wanted research. Now what people want are off-the-shelf solutions. In the next five years, they're going to be off-the-shelf solutions, plug and play, which work in vertical industries with huge returns. And I think that's where we're going. We don't see anything like that yet. Now, he said this back in 2019. And it was on this podcast, if you want to check it out, called Validate Neural Networks Without Data. Now, the pace might be a little amped up from 2019 because of all the hype cycle. But I think his promise has actually come true for the most part. So those who are brave enough to extend full stack, you'll be empowered in the Elixir ecosystem. So build something, fine tune something, learn something. And I didn't write this book. I don't make any money on this book. Uh, this book was probably an inspiration for me. I would highly recommend this book for anyone who feels like a lot of these topics, deep learning, are really interesting, but they've not yet had a good resource. Um, I just swear by this book. I think it's absolutely amazing. Thank you.